Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bad for Your Health Entertainment. I am Tom, and tonight I am joined by Mr. Steve Madsen, a writer best known for his work at DC Comics, Marvel Comics, and one of my personal favorites, Dark Horse Comics. Steve, how are you tonight? I'm good. doing great, Tom. It's, uh, it's nice to see you. It's good to meet you. It's a, As I said in the pregame, you are a favorite of mine, dating back to some of your work. Steve is best known for writing Superboy and the Ravers, Superboy Losing It, one of my favorite story arcs, The Volcano, and oh, I just love that storyline. But you're also known as a colorist on Green Lantern during the heyday of Green Lantern in the 90s. Steve also worked with Marvel Comics on Night Thrasher and Black Panther and Boris the Bear at Dark Horse, just to name a few titles. But Steve, I want to start with uh, your inspirations. What got you into comic books and writing and sort of the creative juices? What got the creative juices flowing for you? Well, you know, as a, as a kid, I always loved to read um, all kinds of stuff. I mean, in grade school, I loved Encyclopedia Brown. I don't know if you, if kids today even know that book. But, it's you know, it was kind of for grade school kids where this boy detective solved mysteries. Love that stuff. That that led me to more reading eventually stuff like Lord of the Rings and um, seventh grade, I started reading comics and I always liked to draw. And it's like, Ooh, I could bring those two interests together. And you know, ever since seventh grade, I wanted to get into comics, just, just kept drawing and writing and waiting for a shot. Were you the proverbial best artist in class? Uh, you know, some of my classmates will, tell you that they yeah they say hey you're the guy that was always off in the corner drawing and it's like mm, okay I'm, i'll cop to that yeah <laughs> what, what were the things you were drawing were you drawing like the stereotypical batman and you know things like that superman well i was always interested in doing my own characters so like through middle school and high school i was designing characters i just love to do that sort of thing and um one of the stories i haven't really told is I had a you know big group of those characters and i was reading a issue of the comic reader it was like the tv guide for comic books back yeah. in the 70s and 80s and it talked about this new comic they're doing a, a revival of the old dial h for hero concept where the kids would dial up and they'd change into different characters the difference with this one is they're going to use uh readers suggestion for the heroes and it's like oh i got all these characters so I think I was like a, a senior in high school, maybe just graduated, and I, I sent him a package of three. I sent him the Flying Buttress, which had, uh, you know, I was doodling during art history, obviously. A character called Ultramarine, which is probably from an art class, as he's an Ultramarine Blue. And then a character called Visual Purple, which is a fluid in the inner eye that helps us see. I thought, oh, those are great names for characters. And sure enough, I got a letter back from DC and said, hey, we're going to use your characters and you get this free dial H for hero t-shirt it's like great this is you know this is the start and uh the flying buttress first appeared in a but the preview issue legion 272 i think uh, legion of superheroes they used to have those previews i think that's how the teen titans first appeared in DC. yeah they would always like appear in like a four page preview or a preview yeah. page yeah so the Flying Buttress first appeared in the Legion of Superheroes 272, a little preview. And then the, when the series started an adventure, he was the first kind of antagonist the Dial H for Hero Kids fought. And it was kind of neat. He uh, he actually survived the story. And I thought, hey, neat. He's, he's out there in the DC universe there somewhere. Uh, I created a character that's in the DC universe. And the other interesting thing was... Um, Ultramarine showed up on the cover of that issue of Adventure, and I thought, oh, neat, she's going to be in there too. But when I read the story, she was only on the cover, and I only got the one t shirt. So, like, well, they used two characters, but I only got one t shirt, and she's only on the cover. What's going on? So, after that, when I sent in more characters, I used different names. I used my roommates and my brother and friends' names. and more of them got picked to use and I got more t-shirts, but eventually I found the original art that was unused to that issue on the internet. And not only was Ultramarine in the story, but Visual Purple was in there too. They, they used both of them, but for some reason they rewrote the story at the last minute and they got cut out. But I found the original art on the internet. So that was pretty neat. 
But how cool was it at that time in your at your age to have a character that existed in DC Comics that had to have been the world? Well, it was terrific because you know in the in the original version of the story, the one they didn't use, he was a robot who was destroyed. But in the published version, he was like a biological mineral based creature that lived. And then I actually brought him back in Superboy and the Ravers. So kind of cemented his place there in the, the DC universe. Well, we'll get to Superboy and the Ravers in a little bit. That's one of the, in my opinion, Superboy and the Ravers is one of the most underrated titles of that era. Tom, I love your enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate my enthusiasm will carry could has no limits. You know, I, I when I'm enthusiastic about a title or something or somebody, oh, it's it's going to get pushed. I'll, I'm going to uh, I'm going to push it to no end. But talk to me as you got a little older. You're also up into the acting and the performing arts. Was that something that was also on your radar? Well, not really. So when I went to college, you know, I was I was doing the, the art major thing and uh, the theater department needed an artist to do posters and program covers and uh, painting sets and stuff like that. So I got a job with the theater department there. And uh, I noticed, hey, these guys are having a lot of fun with this theater. So I, I started auditioning for plays and, you know, I wasn't super talented, but I got got a few roles and it, it was terrific. And then years, decades later, uh, they were filming three TV series simultaneously in Portland. There was Grimm, Leverage and Portlandia. And a lot of my friends from uh, theater days were getting roles. You know, it's like I'm seeing them on television. It's like, hey, that looks pretty fun. I want in on that. And so, you know, I took a few few classes and got myself an agent and was, you know, got cast in a few roles, did a commercials, and uh, hopefully I can keep doing that. I, I agree. That would be pretty cool. You you have always been a West Coast guy, Portland, Oregon, that area, of yeah. the northwest part of the United States. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it became kind of a hotbed for uh, comic book artists right around the time Dark Horse started. Yeah, um, I think I've told this story before. Uh, Ron Randall, who did a lot of stuff for DC and Marvel, and is currently doing Trekker. Uh, we went super cool, super cool man. I love Ron Randall. Trekker yeah, he, he is did, my he favorite. With him. Yeah, yeah, I loved Ron Randall. He's a class act. I'm sorry I cut you out. Ron Randall's a class act. I love Trekker. Well, we agree on that. He he and I went to the same grade school, middle school, and high school, but he was just, just slightly older enough than me that I never ever met him until he came back from um, you know, living in New York and going to the Kubert School and working for DC. And eventually he moved home. And when he got home, it's like, hey, Ron, like we're neighborhood guys. <laughs> so that was a, a wonderful contact. <laughs> Take me through your how you, you first got involved with DC, but then how did Dark Horse come about? Because I love Dark Horse comics to no end. I think they're, I mean, I think they're the most underrated, the most um, ripped off, you know, in regards to IE uh, intellectual properties. I feel like they've been, everyone sort of took from Dark Horse, but you were sort of there at the beginning of Dark Horse back in 86. What was that like? So it was, it was just a wonderful uh, bit of timing. Um, as I mentioned, Ron had moved back uh, from New York and this was all having to do with Federal Express getting going. And uh, these guys could then send their artwork and it would be from New York to Portland in a day and back and forth uh, before they all had to live in New York City and you know the expense that you know, came along. A simpler that. time, right? A simpler time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so now they can live back in, you know, their hometowns, be near their friends and family and still be able to make their deadlines. And so I happened to be in Portland where people were starting to come back to the area. And right about the same time, Dark Horse had shown up. And uh, I'd actually been working as uh, Paul Galacy's assistant, who uh, this is another coincidental story. Uh, I was a huge Paul Galacy fan from Master of Kung Fu, and yep. I heard that he just moved to Portland with his wife, who was who was from here. And I wrote him a snail mail letter, and he said, "Yeah, come over and see the studio," and so forth. And I went over there, and the first thing he says to me is, "Hey, I think you know my wife." And it's another. Uh, I'd, I'd gone to middle school and high school with Paul's wife, and she'd gone back to New York to fashion school or something like that, and they'd met and came back here. So that 
start a relationship with Paul and I was working as his assistant, which uh, led to me coloring some of his color covers for Eclipse and uh, doing more coloring for Eclipse. And then Dark Horse started up. They had done uh, the two titles, uh, first issue Dark Horse Presents, first issue Boris the Bear. And they had done those in um, one of Mike Richardson's uh, comic shops and Mike's kitchen table. They, they put the books together. <laughs> And since they had sold so well, they said, okay, look, we're going to start a comic book company. And they, they rented this little spot in Portland. And since I had already done a little bit of uh, professional work and all these pros hadn't you know, congregated in Portland quite yet, I went to the comic shop where Randy Stradley was working and I bought one of his back issues and I took it up to him and he, he was ringing it up and he said, hey, I wrote this comic book. And I said, no, there's no comic book pros that live in Portland, is there? And he said, yeah, in fact, we're starting this, this company. I said, well, yeah, I, I've covered these, colored these covers for Eclipse. And I did this and this. And he said, hey, you know what? We, we need colorists. And so once they opened up their office, I just went in there every day and never left. Uh, there's no job interview or no <laughs> answer an ad or anything. I just kept showing up and, you know, did their production work for them and that kind of stuff. And you know, then they needed fill in stories, Tom. And it's like, well, I've got an idea for a four pager. I've got an idea for a six pager. And it just kind of happened from there. I miss the days of Dark Horse Presents. I always say that's the most missed book that I can think of. I miss the old eight page formats, the four page, whatever the setup was. I miss that dearly, dearly. Yeah, that was, that was terrific. It was, uh, you know, kind of anything goes. Uh, as long as uh, Mike and Randy liked it, that was kind of their one rule for Dark Horse. They were only going to publish stuff that they liked. And, you know, they did a great job with that. Now, I've never met Mike, but I, I've met Randy briefly. Uh, at least maybe I think it was through Messenger. He and I spoke one time. I, I could be misspeaking. He's a cool guy. They're both yeah. cool guys. Uh, terrific. Yeah. Very creative, hardworking. It was a lot of fun. What is it about Portland that makes it such a hotbed for the Pacific Northwest of creative for creative people? What is I, I, Randy Emberlin told me it's just like this odd. He, he almost couldn't describe how Portland is. Can can maybe you can describe it? What what brings Portland? What brings the creative people to Portland? Well, you know, prior to COVID and you know all the the stuff going on the last few years, you know, Portland's motto was keep Portland weird. Um, and <laughs> I think they did their best to live up to that. And um, it was kind of a anything goes, very liberal, uh, very encouraging to artists and uh, very friendly. Um, lots of networking, networking opportunities to talk to other people in other artistic fields. And you know, he just kind of feeds off each other. Um, you know, very friendly. I would love to visit the Pacific Northwest one of these days. It's just, you know, we I'm from Massachusetts. We sort of have, you know, our own places that breed uh, creativity. But it's like I always see the West Coast as sort of like the creative flux, the creative capital, if you will. Yeah, I I, I don't know if it's quite as hopping as it, it used to be, but uh, I think it's still very welcoming to the creative class and uh, – yeah, just come out and visit. Always wanted to see Portland. Maybe not the Trailblazers, but I would definitely love to see Portland. A <laughs> Celtics fan? You know, I got to say, yeah. I'd say, I, I, you know, Celtics fan, you know, Bird and all that. I, that was when I kind of was growing up. And then, you know, Rick Pitino. I remember the Rick Pitino days of the Celtics. You know, Larry Bird's not walking through that door, you know. <laughs> just don't go to the restaurant with Rick Pitino. But, yeah, Celtics fan. It's a, it's a pretty good basketball team historically, Tom. I, I understand. Yeah, you know, 08, you can't beat it. But I will say from Massachusetts, the, there's nothing worse than a Boston fan. I can okay. say that really. There's nothing worse than a Boston fan. You know, well, you got to remember. Good for a long time. Exactly. I love the 4-13 and 13 Patriots, mind you. It reminded me of what it was like 30 years ago when Hugh Millen was the quarterback. I can live with it. I love it. It was great. Everything comes full circle. Sure. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about your relationship and how you met an individual named Carl Kiesel, another cool guy. Everyone we talk about is cool. 
how how did you meet this individual? I loved Carl Kiesel. Super nice guy. He was a funny guy when I met him. Yeah, he, uh, he's got a terrific sense of humor and it comes through in his writing. Um, yeah. I think the very first time I met him, he was probably still living in New York. I met him at a, a San Diego Comic-Con and he um, he was a very normal looking guy. You know, I <laughs> just starting to go to these conventions and you know, a lot of the artists were kind of, you know, living in mom's basement types. And I know what you uh, mean. <laughs> they're super, super talented. And, uh, you know, I love their work, but it's like, huh, I did not picture this guy like this. But, you know, Carl was like a, a normal looking guy. And I think I even said that to him. It's like, wow, Carl, you look like a normal person. And uh, he laughed. And uh, eventually he moved out to Portland with his wife at the time, Barbara. And you know, I think they they did some work at Dark Horse, but he was uh, always doing stuff for for DC and Marvel. Uh, the big two. Leader, but then as a writer for for a lot of stuff, Daredevil, Superboy, Superman, all, all those titles. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I remember he and his wife moved around town quite a bit, and I was always uh, on hook to help him move. So I, I became a buddy of his. I was the guy who would show up to help him tote his comic books from one house to the next. That was, now we're neighbors, and he actually lives lives pretty close. Now, when all this is going on, are you still reading comics actively, or were you just working? I, I've heard stories where guys who are working on it don't read them, or vice versa. What was your story with that? Well, you know, at first I, just, I read everything. Um, loved everything and then uh when you get into the business you're always looking for uh i, I wanted to work for dc and marvel at the beginning and so it's always looking for properties that were underutilized it's like so i was reading a lot of obscure stuff it's like i wonder, I wonder if i could pitch this character to come fit in the you know the current dc universe like you know the war that time forgot or ultra the multi-alien or some of these more obscure things that hadn't been brought back in a while. It's like DC has to protect those trademarks. So they're going to want to publish these things every 10 years or so. Why not me? Cause you want to, you want to get your foot in the door somehow. So I was reading, you know, obscure back issues like that. And then I also liked uh, the more artsy fartsy kind of stuff like um, flaming carrot, yummy fur, <laughs> Some of those things, uh, I was reading a lot of that. I loved uh, Mr. Monster in the 80s. Um, Mike Barron's The Badger. Uh, I thought that was really well written, always surprising. Uh, I'm going to spin it back to you now. I like your enthusiasm. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, no, those were terrific. Um, yeah, they're terrific books. Long time. And uh, these days, um, I'm not reading nearly as much as I, I used to. Uh, no. Right now, I have a, a project where I'm trying to read some books that I was never able to finish in high school English class. It's like, okay, I've got a little time now. I'm going to go back and read these things and see if I can get through them. What kind of books? What are we talking here? Well, we're talking about like, uh, you know, Moby Dick and Don Quixote. Um, 1984, things like that. 1984 and Brave New World. Those are those are both on the book. Shelf, they're waiting. I'm going to try and read those back to back. Oh, Huxley with Brave New World. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, good book. James Joyce's Ulysses. I could never get through that in high school. I'm going to give that my best shot now. It's a little wordy. It's a little yeah. wordy. <laughs> <laughs> Not wrong with 1984, though. You'll like yeah. 1984. Mm -hmm. The yeah, movie. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what I'm reading these days. Uh, my, I think I mentioned my daughter's into comics, and she loves uh, Usagi Ujimbo, so you know I keep up with that. And um, but yeah, I, uh, the stuff my friends do, uh, Ron's Trekker and Carl's uh, Impossible Jones. Um, I watch, read all that stuff still. Is is that something you've considered doing, like an original character, and going the Kickstarter route? You know, I've. When I got out of comics, I, um, I became a, a firefighter paramedic, and these days I'm working uh, in the emergency room. And I'd love to do some, you know, like true stories of uh, 
most of my days doing that stuff. Uh, I probably wouldn't do a original superhero stuff anymore, but you know, some, some true life autobiographical stuff might be kind of fun. I like that. Truth is always stranger than fiction. I yeah. think, I think something more grounded and real is yeah. relatable. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the stories w won't really seem very real. It's, just, you know, it's stuff that human beings do the strangest things, Tom. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure you've seen a few things. Yeah. But uh take me take me to Superboy. How did that come about? So um you know slowly these people are starting to move to Portland. There's there's Carl, there's Paul Galacy, uh, Randy Emberlin, Ron Randall, these guys. Uh, another guy who showed up was uh, Kurt Busick, who Oh Kurt Busick. And now he's doing <laughs> Astro City. Um yep. and we kind of had this like Algonquin group where we'd sit down and talk about stuff. It was kind of Kurt driven because he had he had just had his success with Marvels and he was you know thinking about other projects and things to do. And uh, I don't know how I got an invite. I was just happy to be have a spot at the table. But you know he they'd pitch concepts and you'd offer criticisms or ideas, additions and. Uh, you know, Carl was there, and eventually Carl had some sort of secondary project to do while he was working on Superboy and said, hey, I can't make the deadlines for both things. Can you help me write Superboy? Yes, Carl. Yes, I can. I will help you write Superboy. I will help you write Superboy. And it was, it was just based on, you know, these discussions we'd sit around having about story ideas and uh, pitches for, you know, he, Ultra the Multi Alien or the World Land That Time Forgot, that kind of stuff. And, you know, you get criticism and feedback, and I, apparently they, they liked my criticism and feedback. So I ended up um, doing fill ins for both Carl and Kurt. So that was a huge opportunity. But th at the time in the industry when you got Superboy, that was a hot time. Yeah, uh, comics were selling uh, like hotcakes yeah. a lot. Like I remember it back in the day. They, it was you know the revolution had happened. I don't mean to use air quotes on that, but it was just like every the death had death had already death had already occurred, right? Superman right. had that's, already died, right? That was uh, that's kind of where Carl came into uh, his writing. He it was the same thing with him as an anchor. He was always sending story ideas to the you know, the editor and the writer and that kind of thing. And, you know, they liked his ideas. Uh, I think he'd done that with Suicide Squad. And he was doing that while he was inking stuff for Death of Superman. And then so when they started doing the big return of Superman arc, which, you know, Steel and Superboy and the Radicator and the Cyborg, um, Carl was one of the main architects of that. And so, you know, it's just, you know, just impressing people with your ideas and your enthusiasm and, uh, that's how he got into it. And, you know, he gave me kind of the, the same helping hand. But you had the keys essentially to Superboy with losing it. Losing it was a cool, oh, I think it was like, what, five or six issues back then. I, my favorite cover of that was the one with the volcano and Super Connor. Yeah, just... that was a lot. That was funny because it was uh, like a Tom Grummet did sort of a, a movie poster kind of thing with that. You know, you're right. You t it looks exactly like uh, the Towering Inferno, and I, I, I have it right there. Something of that t of the '70s. You know, I have a lot of your books that you've done right here, including my favorite Night Thrasher issue. But it was. Uh, don't tell me it's the one I don't have. I will be put off the There it is. You know, just how it has all the faces on the names, and you can I can almost visualize it sort of being like you know Steve McQueen or Robert Redford, just how they're drawn and spaced apart. Yeah, uh, Carl was a huge uh, Jack Kirby fan, and that uh, Victor Volcanum was uh, the villain of that issue, was a super obscure villain in one of Jack Kirby's uh, Jimmy Olsen stories. And, you know, I never thought I'd see that guy again, so it was wonderful to work with one of Kirby's characters. The villain. <laughs> I love how he just labeled that on the title, <laughs> Look, on the cover. The villain. The villain. How did Superboy and the Ravers come up, though, of spinning Superboy into another title? Because 
it, I, I have to admit, I almost forgot about Superboy and the Ravers in a way as I got older. And it's like, Superboy had two titles at one point. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's like we were talking about before. Comics were hot. They were making a lot of money, um, both the companies and the writers and artists, because they were paying royalties back then. And so they wanted to, you know, Superboy was hot. Can we exploit that? And uh, they asked Carl, say, hey, can you come up with a, another Superboy title? And he was he was busy doing other things and working on the regular Superboy and had some ideas for going in different directions. And so it's the same thing. He brought me in uh, and said, let's, let's work on this. Let's figure this out. Here's an opportunity. And we've got a, a little bit of heat for the concept of Superboy and the Ravers being a little stuck in the, the 90s. But um, it was our idea is we wanted a book that had a logical reason for teenagers to get together on a consistent basis. No, and it was set, it's ahead. a 90s story. It's a, it's a 90s story. Right, right. So, yeah, it's, it was perfect to us in that this is a logical reason. These guys are going to come together and go to this party. That's what the teenagers I knew were doing. They weren't out fighting crime. <laughs> so it was like this is a logical reason to get together every month and you know at these parties and such you have the romances and the the fist fights and all that kind of stuff too and you just ramp that up to a superhero kind of level and it makes sense for them to get together every month this way so that's kind of how it started 19 issues though i applaud you for that that's i look back do you look back at that with fond memories of of creating like a uh i don't want to say a lost chapter but a, a lost chapter of the dc universe at the, at its hottest time well it's you know it's interesting coming back to comics selling an awful lot back then i think the money people had a formula and superboy and the ravers sold very well at the beginning but you know, there's kind of a downward arc and they're they're looking for a certain point where it's like, hey, you know what? If we cancel this title and start a new one, we'll start higher. And yeah, there'll be a downward arc again, but it'll be selling more than this one during its mid issues. So, you know, we had planned kind of a, a storyline to go to about 24 and if we had made it that far, we kind of uh, blow it up and start with a new concept with issue 25. And But at some point, the money people looked at it and said, hey, we're going to keep making money on this. It's worth doing until about issue 16 or 17. And then we're, you know, probably cancel it and, you know, start something else up that will sell more because they they wanted that money. That was the money. It's all about the money. In back then. And we said, hey, you know what? We're, we're awfully close to finishing this. If you could give us like four or five more issues, we could end it with 19. We'd have to you know, compress it a little bit, but um, we could end it on a, a good note. And they said, oh, you know what? Okay. So I, I applaud them for doing that. They gave us, I think it was four or five extra issues to finish telling it. And we still had to compress to get it the way we wanted. But we, we told pretty much the, the big overall arc from issue one to 19. Is that, is that, that's gotta be difficult though, to compress essentially six issues into, you know, three or four or five. Yeah. We, we lost a lot of the uh, individual characters arc. We, we told our whole big arc of the rave and what it was there for and what, what that intrigue was about that we were satisfied with that, but we wanted to do a lot more stuff with uh, sparks and hero coming out as gay. Uh, we really didn't get to follow up on that. Uh, half life and you know what his, his life was like during the 50s with his girlfriend we wanted to get into some stories like that and we had to throw that all out um aura and her uh family in hong kong uh just didn't get to do the the in-depth but the overall arc we we kind of did what we wanted to do those are the moments you love though those character moments because character sells in my opinion Absolutely. That's a, uh, that hurt. There was some good stuff uh, in the drawing board for those. Uh, there was a Halloween issue with a, a really great uh, half-life on the cover where he had the, the huge face. 
And uh, we wanted to do a lot more stuff in in Rutland, Vermont. I don't know if you remember the. It used to be Batman a, two Batman two thirty seven is set in Rutland, Vermont. That is my all time that. yeah all time favorite Batman issue. Right there's you you can do a, a Wikipedia search of uh, Rutland, Vermont Halloween parties, and they had these real parties there where it was early cosplay, and they had superhero theme floats and stuff. Oh, so yeah. Year after year, there were uh, stories set in Rutland. And, you know, I, I love that stuff that you did. And so it's like, let's set a story in Rutland. But we only got to do like two or three pages there. We would have, you know, expanded that as a whole Halloween issue. But we had to use stuff to to finish up the bigger story. So that's that's where the compression happened. You ever been to Rutland, Vermont? I have not. It's it's something. It can be something, but it, it, it's cool. It's cool. Vermont's yeah. a cool state. I like Vermont. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if uh, they still have that uh, Halloween parade or not, but that would be terrific to, to visit someday. The place to go to around Halloween, Salem, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah? Oh, I have been to Salem. Like, yeah. Cool cool town, city, all that. Shout out to Harrison's Comics. It's where I buy a lot of the obscure random back issues in my library. But, like, this just that you know, collection of great people and in good old Salem. I love the uh, statue they have of uh, Elizabeth Montgomery in her bewitched character. Oh yeah, oh yeah, right there on the main street. That's actually right down the block from the the comic store in in Salem. Is right next to a um, a body piercing place. Not just your, you get the like everything and uh, you yeah, know everything could be pierced, Tom. I understand. Yeah, and I'm walk, you know, I'm walking to go to Harrison's. You know, I got my leather jacket on. I you know, I, I feel cool. I'm feeling good. Guys, like, hey man, you want to come? No, nah, man, I'm good. I'm, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I basically like duck in and hide in the, the Hellraiser you section. All the natural <laughs> holes in my body I need. This, this is yeah, enough. yeah. That's that's it. But no, Harrison's is cool. I love I love Salem. It's a great it's a great place, great place for Halloween. I want to make my way to Sleepy Hollow, but Rutland, yeah. like you said, Batman two thirty seven is like that that Neil Adams. That that's cool. I love that. Talk to me about Night Thrasher. Such an underrated character, such an underrated book. And my favorite issue from your run is yeah. 19. I love oh. 19. Uh, temper Tantrum. Temper yeah. Tantrum. Yeah, you know, um, it was a similar situation. Uh, Kurt had signed to do a um, four issue run of Night Thrasher, uh, the Money Don't Buy arc. Um, yep, and Marvels was a huge success for him, and he was getting other offers and other stuff to do. And he said, "Hey, Steve, I, I don't think I can finish this money. Don't buy arc." Uh, I think he did the first one by himself, and then I helped him script the second one, and then we co-did three and four. And um, you know, it's just just kind of helping him out. And uh, Tom Brevoort, the editor, liked what I was doing. Um, and he gave me that issue 19 as a fill in. And then Kurt came back and we did uh, another two issues uh, together. And, you know, I, I thought it turned out pretty well. And it's something we did in Superboy and the Ravers is we tried to use a lot of existing characters uh, in DC comics. We wanted, you know, he had a whole universe to deal with, but I wanted to visit places that we'd seen before. And it was the same with Night Thrasher. Um, that Tantrum character had appeared in a couple of different issues. And he he was kind of Night Thrasher's main villain. Um, yeah. Just hadn't seen him very long. So uh, I, I wanted to bring him back. And uh, that's that's how that worked. I love Temper Tantrum. I love the villain issue. I love that whole run. But I do love the the... Well, first of all, I love the cover. The cover just screams, you know, the, the whole use of drugs and things like that in the issue with the multiple faces. I just, I think, it, and the, the the story of the old people fighting back, uh, to me, harkened a little, I, I'm not saying this was an influence, but it reminded me a lot of re, uh, of uh, Charles Bronson's Death Wish 3. I don't know why, yeah. when I was reading, it struck me as that, like, where they finally, the locals had enough of this gang and they're going to fight back. Well, you know, with Charles Bronson, that's not, I'm not saying that was your influence, but that's what it reminded me of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the tantrum character was you know, kind of a, a bad, bad guy. And 
So he just wanted to try and, you know, redeem him somehow and, you know, try to make, keep the stakes high. Um, so brought in the family and the, the neighbors and that kind of stuff. And uh, thanks for your appreciation. I, I enjoyed working on that issue. Well, I, I'm glad you did it. It's, it's going in my, my favorite. My, you know, every, I think every comic fan has their box of favorite issues. And Night Thrasher 19 is in there. Yeah. Um, it's a very early issue by uh, Tom Derenick, who went on to do lots of really great Justice League stuff for uh, DC. I don't think he's super proud of that issue because it might have been even his first. But the cool thing about it is um, editors will always tell you, yeah, I try to pair a really experienced inker with a, a new penciler. But you don't really see it. In this issue, uh, Brevoort actually did it. Uh, Tom Derenick was brand new and he gave him Tom Palmer. Uh, one of the greatest thinkers the, ever. The legendary Tom Palmer. Legendary Tom Palmer. And so uh, it, it really turned out well. And years and years and years later, I had Tom pencil me a, a nice Night Thrasher uh, full figure. And I got Tom Palmer to ink it before he died. And so, oh. uh, it's, you know, it's priceless to me. And it's the current Tom Derenick, not the early Tom Derenick, the super skilled Tom Derenick of today. A polished Tom Derrick. Yeah, looks great. I love that. Um, are you big on the convention scene today in this in the modern world where every comic convention is like, you know, star studded and legacies and all that? Talk to me about that. Do you have any experience with Comic Cons? So um I, I mentioned my daughter being into comics and yeah. my son doesn't really read the comics, but he likes the Marvel movies and he likes gaming and all that sort of stuff. And when I was in, uh, pro I think we have a technical snafu with Steve Madsen right now, as he was telling me a story about his uh, son being a fan of the comic book movies and games. Um, right now, one of the biggest selling games in the Marvel lexicon is the Spider-Man Two video game. Uh, the, the, what Marvel has done with Spider-Man and Somniac Studios is really one of the best selling games of, of its time and of all time. But I would like to see more superhero games and movies focus on the characters that, that some of the lesser known writers and artists have done. I would love to see Superboy that Steve had worked on done, even if it was done on a direct to video level, um, I don't know if that'll ever happen. I hope it does, truthfully. But uh, I have to say, as we're as we're talking here, and we haven't we've lost Steve. Steve will be coming back. I hope momentarily. Uh, the thing I like about Steve's work is how he pays attention to certain characters that are forgotten about, or you know, he, he said something earlier that that struck me as, you know, DC needs to keep the trademarks on some of these characters for has to keep them so they have to publish the character every so often and one of the things that's one thing that i like to notice myself as a as a as a lapsed reader is which characters are not being used as i've gotten a little older and my tastes have changed i've focused on characters that are completely forgotten about you know possibly 80 plus years um i think that one of them is I'll tell you I'll tell you a story as Steve's going to come back into the studio in a second. I like to focus on characters that are pulpy. You know, I've been reading a lot of the Spider and the Shadow, and uh, um, I'll tell you it, I make no secret about this. Marilyn Knapp and I have done a review on the Tom Conway Falcon pictures, and I'll tell you I'm, I do I dove in head first with the George Sanders Saints movies, and I'll be starting to watch the Hugh Sinclair Saint movies. I like those sort of crime driven B movie titles. You know, those are characters that are long forgotten. I know the saint is immensely popular with the Roger Moore television version. And if you want the Val Kilmer big budget version, but I would like to see some of those characters return. And, and that's why I've enjoyed talking to Steve so far, because this character, you know, th there's a wide variety of, characters that can be used in dc dark horse image marvel time to focus on some of the lesser known characters and i think that um i think that's really cool to focus on some of the lesser knowns because 
what was once old is new again is the old saying if not i've just completely butchered the saying but that but that you get the gist of that uh before steve comes back into the studio i suppose i can announce the good news formally on the video format and that is that bad for your health entertainment will now be airing i don't have an exact date yet but uh it's going to be picked up by west springfield public access television i am uh, deeply honored and humbled that this content is going to reach the western Sp west springfield market i don't have dates and times yet as i posted on a uh the other day but once i get those dates and times i will glad i will post it so we can celebrate if you will have a have a you know knowing that this is going to be picked up on a public access channel in the western part of the state of uh, massachusetts i'm honored by that and i can't wait to it can't wait for it to drop. I don't know what the first episode is going to be. See, the, the trick is I'm going to give them one of my older episodes that I'm a fan of. And there's several uh, as we're as we're flirting with episode 150 here on, you know, Facebook and YouTube. Um, I don't know exactly which one I've narrowed it down to about five or six. So when I reveal which one is. Uh, I will reveal which one will be the pilot episode for the Western Springfield public access. And I can't wait for that. That's going to be tremendous. And as I said earlier, dates and times are going to be announced sometime, hopefully within the next week or two. As, as we move forward with Bad for Your Health, I don't know exactly what the next episode is going to be. I want to focus a little bit on some of the uh, B movies of the 40s. And uh, those are going to be tremendous as we'll talk to them in a second. And uh, Steve is coming back on. Welcome back, Steve. Sorry for that. That's all right. I love. I actually love snafus. I love when that happens because it makes you think on your toes. I remember one time I was watching an NFL game. I think it was the the power outage Super Bowl between the Ravens and the 49ers. Okay. And uh, the ones that can think on their toes were the ones that were talking. Like Dan Marino was kind of sitting there, like. You know, and, and Boomer Esiason and Bill Cowher kind of carried like the power outage by just having a natural conversation. So when snafus happen, I try to go on my toes. Nicely done. Thank you. I was thought you had said something about your son being a big fan of the Marvel games, so I kind of went on a tangent about how Insomniac with the Spider-Man games is is absolutely killing it. I hope that was what you were going to say. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, you mentioned the video games. And that's funny. I, I don't play video games. I don't gamble and I don't do crack. Not because I know how bad all those things are. It's because I'm afraid I'd really enjoy all of them. Just stay away from that stuff. <laughs> you were saying, though, about the, the comic conventions, too. Yeah, so... Um, when I was a pro, I used to go to San Diego Con all the time. Um, you know, it was just kind of a, a business thing. But then, uh, you know, when I was doing the, the paramedic firefighting stuff, I, I didn't go back. Once my kids got involved in the Marvel movies and comics, they realized dad could get them into the San Diego Comic Con because that's a, that's a tough ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and so I became the cool dad again after many years. And so we started going down as a family. So, uh, you know, and I got to see my friends and, um, you know, I, I moderated a panel for, for Paul Galassi when he was down there. And that, that was a lot of fun. Um, but I don't go as a guest much anymore. I just, and, and it's nice because when I was down there, I was either networking or sitting at the table, you know, coloring con sketches because I, I the washer went out and I needed to, buy a new washer and make some money and so it was, it was <laughs> like a day at work you know it's but now it's it's for fun would you be opposed to going to a convention if someone said hey would you know come east coast southeast florida etc oh not at all i you know and i have a couple times uh, it's a convention in idaho my i took my daughter to a few years ago as a guest and that was uh so she got to see dad you know schmoozing and interacting and signing autographs so that was a lot of fun so that's no. pretty cool yep there's a convention that uh i like out here in the northeast it's called terrificon it's probably one of the biggest in new england you got the providence comic-con and terrificon in connecticut and i think terrificon is just amazing you gotta if you ever want to see connecticut in new england that's the one all right, all right. oh uh mitch is a good guy 
you're not the guy that's going to be sitting there charging 60 bucks for an autograph like one of some of these other legends i'm sure you've seen horror stories of at conventions you got any good ones you can share that don't that don't uh demean anybody <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's tough to name names but uh you know i just mentioned uh i think in our pre-chat that there's a con in portland right now the uh, fan expo and it's yes. one of those big mega traveling ones and they've got a huge number of celebrity guests that they bring around you know the the guys from the new ahsoka tv series and walking dead and yeah uh, all those kind of guys um but then they have local co comic book people and you know some that they bring in and I was chatting with some of my friends and like Chris Warner was charging like a, a dollar a autograph unless you wanted Predator number one autograph and then <laughs> the price was higher. Uh, you know, and they, they charge extra for comics that are going to be graded. Uh, but otherwise, you know, the, the guys I respect, they're, they're keeping the just the regular comic books uh, affordable, even with the signature. I'll name drop. I'll tell yeah. you, Dan Dan Jurgens. I love Dan Jurgens to death. But when you go up to his table, it's like Superman seventy five is just like twenty bucks for the pop. Any other story from Death of Superman, maybe fifteen, ten for um, Thor or something like that. What what the other titles he's best known for? And then it's like five for everything else. So me moonlighting as as a good guy and being being me. I went up to him with Justice League International and he's sitting there, you know, he's doing his thing. He's got his glasses like that. And I'll, you know, bring Justice League International. And I was like, Hey Dan, how's it going? He just kind of goes like <laughs> Justice League International, huh? He was like, well, thank you. You know, we're talking about booster gold, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And you know, as I go like this, you know, with the wallet, he just goes, Oh no. Oh no. You're good. You're good. <laughs> Oh, you know, I only had two of I only had two of them too, so it wasn't like I brought them like a stack, right? Because uh, you know you see people like that, and I was just sort of like, "Thank you, sir." We had a good chat. We shook hands, off our merry way. Randy Emberlin was the best when it came to that, though, because he you know inked Carnage, and uh, it was like that book was like twenty five, other Spider Man like three seventy five or four hundred was like ten, but then when I went up to him with Dark Horse Presents, he was like, "Oh my god." <laughs> <laughs> you know he's like i don't see this book very often and then you know we had a good chat and it's just like that that's how we that's how i try to win you guys over by showing the appreciation for the work that may have fallen through the cracks or out of the folder or that's the those are the books i go after <laughs> was that randy's uh project mind walk episode of dark horse mind Prince? walk man mind walk yeah. was cool i told him that and he was like he was like because he's so enthusiastic too Right. I love I love talking to him. Like he and I were like, it was like just too like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. But like he was just like, dude, mind walk is awesome. And I was like, dude, mind walk's freaking awesome. Like, let's talk about it. I don't give a crap about Spider Man right now. <laughs> right. You've talked about you've talked about Carnage like for 30 years. I want to know about Mind Walk. Yeah, Randy is a uh, a lot of fun to talk to him about his fanzine days. He was yeah. big in doing the fanzines and you know, meeting sending letters to pros and getting sketches and that kind of stuff and uh he's got rich with history that guy is oh yeah cool guy he was actually one of the first guests i ever had on on this format and i loved i loved talking to him i loved talking to him uh, yeah, yeah. like you guys i love talking to creative people yeah he was uh at the same fan expo he's sitting right next to chris warner so they've been buddies for years and years and years and years so it's the crosstalk between those two guys because both enthusiastic and both are verbose so you just sit back and listen and you learn and you kind of learn stuff oh well, absolutely it's stuff terrific. that might be lost in translation i'm assuming between those two yeah what creatively drives you now though is it the truth tr truth the the true stories of what you've seen in your life or is there anything that you're going for what like what's on your Netflix queue? I don't have Netflix. Well, like what what are we what are we watching? What 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 drives you creatively now at this stage? So I'm gonna display my full nerd credentials here, Tom. Uh, Please, my, you are you ready? My my Four. favorite movie of all time is uh, Buckaroo Banzai from 1984. Peter Weller, Doctor Peter Weller, <laughs> Doctor Peter. Weller. 
So I'm going to talk about this fan expo. Dr. Peter Weller was uh, one of the guests. <laughs> and, you know, they, they have all these celebrities kind of set up in this murderer's row. And they, they all yeah. have their backdrop. And his says, Peter Weller. And it's got a big picture of him as RoboCop. And somebody, I'm assuming it was him, took a big Sharpie and wrote Dr. Peter Weller. <laughs> What it's a, he's a doctor in Renaissance art or or yeah that's I think that's what it is. God bless him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, he, he's kind of becoming Bakru Banzai. That's that's pretty cool. He is. Yeah. <laughs> so I mentioned what that makes that because, what makes ahead. that your favorite movie though? What makes Bakru Banzai your favorite movie? No, I, I saw it in the theater when it first came out, and I thought it was going to be a huge hit. Um, I was. Uh, working down in Southern California at the time. And I saw it at the Egyptian theater, which was um, a theater kind of like man's Chinese theater, a yeah. theme theater that was one of the two big Hollywood experiences. And um, I just thought it was amazing. And then a, a couple of weeks later, I went to a, the world science fiction convention was in Anaheim at that time. And, um, uh, uh, Terry Erdman, who was uh, doing publicity for Buck Rubans, I was there handing out those uh, Buck Rubans I headbands and talking up the movie. And I thought, this is going to be the biggest thing ever. Um, and I mostly enjoyed it just because it was so surprising. Every time I thought they were going to zig, they zagged. Um, and the biggest criticism of the movie was the thing that I liked about it most. It was like coming into the middle of a, a comic book run. It's like, you know, I started reading Spider Amazing Spider-Man in the you know the two hundreds. I yeah. knew a lot of stuff had happened beforehand, and I knew a lot of stuff was going to happen afterwards. And so I had I was trying to catch up, but you know what's what is happening right now? And that's the way Buck Rubanzai was. It's like he he had had adventures before this movie. He'd lived in this world as. It had started before the movie started, and it was going to continue afterwards. And it was like episode five of seven, but it was number one of one. Yeah. So that's frustrating to some, but coming from comics, I was okay with that. I know yeah. those stuff happened before I started watching. Uh, See, it's funny it's you say it like that, because I feel like today the comic book fan can't do that. I may be wrong on that assessment, but I, I feel like if you come from the movies within a new within a year, and you had mentioned it earlier with Superboy and the Ravers, how many Captain America number ones are there going to be? You know, how many Iron Man number ones? And I get it; that's their mount, that's their method. But you know, you start here with number one. There's a downward trend around eleven, but you remodel at number one. You really got the same sale you were at number four sixteen months ago. Yeah, it's. It's tough. Um, you don't you don't know how to market or sell it. You know, just just tell great stories um, and let the fans find it. I, you get these marketing people try to manipulate that, but I, I understand it's a business and they're they're trying to make money, so they got to do their job too. Yeah, I'm with you. I I, I love I loved that back in the day. You you could pick up for me. It was Amazing Spider Man four fifteen. That was the first Spider Man I ever picked up. I knew there were 414 adventures beforehand. Right. But, uh, I'm cool with knowing what I know. I'll right. work my way back. Here we are now. Uh, I'm cool with being at whatever they're at now, 850, probably pushing 900 for all I know. Yeah, so uh, uh, a couple of buddies in my of mine and I, you know, do a Buckaroo Banzai fanzine, and we have a, a Facebook page, World Watch One. So if anybody's a Buckaroo Banzai fan, um, check us out, Facebook. I'll Google check it out. And the 40th anniversary of the movie is coming up uh, this summer, and so we're going to do a, a special issue. And we've we've got all our back issues archived online. But you know, I, I've got a chance to meet and interview the director W. D. Richter and talk on the phone and email the writer Earl Mac Roush and some of the actors. Um, you know, so it's, it's just been terrific. That's that's where I'm putting most of my geek energy these days is working on this 40th anniversary issue of Bakru Banzai Fanzine. And where can where can people reach that? Yeah, World Watch One on Facebook. World Watch One on Facebook. I'll, I'll start sharing it on Bad for Your Health if you if you don't mind. 
I would love that. How about Peter Weller? Have you ever had the conversation with the doc, the good doctor? So um, <laughs> I had a wonderful opportunity a few years ago. Um, the New York Film Festival was having a screening curated by um, Kevin Smith of Buckaroo Banzai. And it happened to be the same weekend as the New York Comic Book Convention. And I was able, <laughs> I was able to get a free uh, pro pass to the New York Comic Con. I had to kind of figure out how I was going to sell to my wife. Hey, I want to go to New York City for a week, you know, from Portland, Oregon, or a weekend from Portland, Oregon, so I can go to this film festival one night and the comic book convention the next day. And I had this brilliant idea. I said, hey, sweetheart, let's go to New York together. And she said, yes. So uh, I got to go see the, the screening. Uh, it's Peter Weller and John Lithgow was there and with Kevin Smith moderating. So that uh, was terrific. He's... He's got a slight affectation. He's like the guy who would write doctor on his banner behind him, but a super smart guy, uh, lots of insights, uh, lots of great stories. Uh, really is becoming Bakru Banzai. And, and, you know, I'll always be known to the world as Robocop. Yeah, um, that's one of those great subversive movies. You know, it's like you think Robocop's, uh, you know, a hero. But, you know, and he is, but the, the bad guys were the, the people who created him and the, the law and order trying to fix Detroit. It was, they were telling a story with that and they had an, a, a political agenda. You know, it's funny you say that because so many people don't get that. And I, I had to watch an interview with Weller where he was talking about the biblical references and Frankenstein, Mary Shelley and... If Job and all these great things and the story that Verhoeven and all them were telling, I was just like, wow, he, he like peeled, you know, he went way bed bath and beyond. Yeah. yeah, he was, he was, he went there. Well, Verhoeven's other uh, misinterpreted movie is at Starship Troopers, you know. The, oh, yeah. Those guys are Nazis and they're kind of portrayed as the good guys, the yes. Starship Troopers, but. They are not. So you have They're to not, you know, look at it beyond that. It's like uh, people criticize this. Like, ah, these good guys are pretty bad. I don't know if this is a good thing. It's like, no, the, they're bad they're guys. They're bad. They're bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. Just because they're killing bugs doesn't doesn't make them good guys. Yeah. That, that That's one of those movies that when I was a kid, even I was just sort of like, these guys are kind of bad. Yeah. Hooven. He was good. Yeah. But I'm I'm Buckaroo Banzai is your favorite film of all time. Yeah, uh, for, I'm not saying it's the best film of all time, but it it, it hit me right in the sweet spot at a at a influential time. It, it just it just surprised me, and I appreciated it for that. Isn't it amazing how certain things like that at uh, the the stars align? You know, the tides are perfect, everything's aligned, and it's just like this one thing is gonna. Stay Absolutely. with you, creative. Uh, you know, one of my favorite movies of all time is is Trancers. <laughs> Trancers. Yeah. Yeah. Trancers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I get it. It's Trancers. It's not the best, but there's something about the time traveling cop, you know, and if you peel the envelope back, you can kind of peel the onion back. You kind of can get all characteristic about it. And I love that. I love that a lot. Yeah. How, how can you explain what you love? It just, just happens. It just happens. It just happens. Listen, before we part ways, though, can, uh, I appreciate you coming on tonight and talking, you know, about your comic career and a little bit of your acting and the the inner nerd of Buckaroo Banzai. But is there anything else you'd like to just that's in you right now that you want to say? You know, the floor is yours. Well, Tom, I just I just really appreciate this opportunity to talk, and I I love enthusiastic people, and I love. Uh, not being ashamed of what you love. So thank you very much for having me on. Oh, I appreciate it. I'd love to have you back on just to shoot the breeze about, I'm not saying like ranch dressing, but we could definitely talk about anything or some older movie that intrigues you. I know I'm going to be doing a few older film reviews in the near future with the, the public access deal, which I'll announce again in a second. Cause I had to chew up airtime when you had your laptop issue, but, uh, if that's something that intrigues you, you're more than welcome to join the party. Uh, you know, I'd love to go into more detail about the, the Dial H for Hero stuff. Uh, All right. There's some more stories. We can do that. I'm going to put it on my uh, list. That sounds great. 
Thank Dial you. H. I look forward to it. I look forward to it too. I'll def we'll be in touch definitely within. We'll definitely I'll message you sometime within the next week or two, and we'll I'll figure out the scheduling. But in closing, I want to thank Steve for coming on tonight. But I suppose I will announce one more time that Bad Fear Health Entertainment has been picked up by the Western Springfield Public Access Channel. I am flattered, humbled, tickled, however you want to, whatever you want to word it, uh, bringing my content to that channel. I don't have the exact date and time yet. When I get the dates and times, I will post them on Facebook for people in that area. And I've narrowed it down to a few episodes that are going to be the pilot. So. Maybe this will be the one, who knows? But I'll be in touch with the fans. I'll be in touch with Steve about coming back on. No episode lined up next. I have nothing in the in the can, no topic. I have to talk to people about what is coming next. But in closing, I want to thank everyone who has supported Bad for Your Health as we go into, a, I don't want to say the next chapter. I suppose volume two would be the proper terminology for that. For Steve Madsen, I am Tom. And also, don't forget to check out Still Dead Illustrations. And it's been a pleasure, and we'll see you soon. Have a good night, everybody. Bye, everybody.